Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Lev received her undergraduate degree in art history from the University of Chicago and her doctorate from the University of Bologna, specializing in the art of the Counter-Reformation. She's been living in Rome since she completed her studies in 1997, and she has been teaching art history for Duquesne University's Italian campus since 2002. She has also taught at John Cabot University and the Pontifical University of Thomas Aquinas. She is a didactic consultant for the Vatican Museums, and her articles have appeared in First Things, the College Art Association, and the Sacred Art Journal. Her books include The Tigress of Forlì, published in 2012, and A Body for Glory, published in 2014. She has lectured worldwide, and her TED Talk on the Sistine Chapel has garnered over 1.8 million views. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Lev. Hi, um, I am very uh, honored and excited, and uh, as we'd say in Italy, emozionata to be here this evening. It's been a long time since I've been on this campus, and I'm also very excited to be at an in-person event. It's been really fun in this Midwest tour actually seeing people again. So it's been a wonderful experience. And the reason why I wanted to do this talk, I wanted to talk about this subject, is because it all began here. Um, years and years and years ago, uh, I was studying Renaissance art here. And um, we had the old 1980s dingy textbooks of the art of the Sistine Chapel and the, Sistine, you know, the works of Michelangelo, and they were all kind of brown, and I was asking myself, do I really want to do this? And um, it was that, it was in during a, a sophomore year class that my professor came in with an image of the Delphic Sibyl that had recently been cleaned, one of the first things to be cleaned in the chapel. And uh, he said, we have to rethink Michelangelo. So in a long and short of it, that's what I've been doing for the past 30 years. I've been rethinking Michelangelo. And so I moved to his country. I learned his language. I read his poems. I, I stalked every place he'd ever been. Um, and and I, I do feel like I've found something new to say about him. So just as a kind of a beginning, when we think of the art of Michelangelo, we do tend to I'd see it's going to be one of those days. All right, um, let's do it this way. We tend to think of the male figures he produces, right? So Michelangelo's figures, uh, the, the, the immense David, the powerful Adam, and of course what I like to refer to as Terminator Jesus, um, the, um, <laughs> a whole new image of the second person of the Trinity. This is what we think of when we think of Michelangelo, but do we ever stop and really ask ourselves, about, oh, come on. Um, do we ever really stop and ask ourselves about the variety of the women that he represents? So, you know, from these remarkable sibyls to this remarkable uh, 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 image of Eve to the uh, very sort of solemn Madonna of Bruges. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here tonight. And it really, the, the extrapolation of really concentrating only on the male figures of Michelangelo ends up. Um, uh, with, with a series of questions, like what are we supposed to make of all of this, and, and, and is, he, is he immune to feminine beauty? And, and, and beyond that, is this disinterest, supposed disinterest in feminine beauty, is that a reflection of a society that doesn't really think much of women? I mean, this sort of, it piles on, sort of snowballs into a series of considerations about Michelangelo, which becomes somewhat problematic. And at the end of the day, much of the problem comes from the issue of the mere study of the form. I mean, one of the sort of great crowning moments in the, in the, in the, in the, representation of Michelangelo is solely and completely interested in only the male form was in the Academia, the, the Academia of Florence exhibition where they put uh, the images of Robert Mapplethorpe next to the images of David and other works of Michelangelo. And really, it became simply a question of a form. As a matter of fact, the director of the Academia, uh, Franca Faletti at the time, was really, she, her whole argument was form is understood as a value in itself, and um, it should be considered regardless of any subject matter or, quote, baggage of personal experience. So this is going to, we just look at Michael, if we just look at Michelangelo for the form, it's going to get, that's, that's the kind of conclusion that we can draw that he's only interested in the male figures. But I'm here to talk about um, uh, thinking a little bit more also about context. 
uh, thinking a little bit more about uh, the, 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 the relation of uh, the images and also the tremendous innovation in what Michelangelo is doing in the Sistine Chapel. So for the sake of brevity, I'm going to confine my analysis of his images to only the, the Sistine Chapel, basically. But on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, it's remarkable when you really sit down and look at it. It's one of the most extraordinary compendiums of female imagery in the entire history of art, if you stop and look. So um, we'll start with a little bit with just the women he knew. I always feel like that's sort of helpful to get a sense of sort of way, this is a world where, frankly, he's not really uh, surrounded by tremendous number of women. We know that his mother, uh, Francesca Neri, died when he was six. His father remarried. Uh, Lucrezia, Lucrezia de Ubaldici died when he was 12. And um, then he had a, just a stepmother who took care of him. One of the more important figures in his life, by the way, is uh, Bonda Ruccellai, who was was his uh, grandmother, whose uh, very important connections probably are what uh, got him into the Medici orbit to begin with. So he does have this sort of very powerful female figure in his life. He also uh, had, a, had an aunt who lived with him. But I think it's sort of interesting to realize uh, the women that he likes to, he really had a very strong uh, attachment to uh, was first and foremost uh, this Matilda of Canossa. And it's really interesting to see that Michelangelo makes a point of, of saying that his family descends from this great woman. He's got this sort of sense of, we don't hear him ever talk about his mother. He mentions her once in a letter. We don't ever hear him really talk about women that he knows. But when he wants to talk about the origin of the Buonarroti family, what, what makes our family special is that he is descended from Matilda of Canossa. And he really, in the, in the biography written by Condivi, Ascanio Condivi, which is basically an autobiography, is Ascanio Condivi's ghost writing for Michelangelo. Uh, it starts with Michelangelo Buonarroti, the unique painter and sculptor, was descended from the Counts of Canossa, a noble and illustrious family. So clearly he was interested in connecting himself with nobility. But most importantly, he was the Countess Matilda, a lady of rare and singular prudence and piety, who did in her lifetime many things worthy of memory. So I'm just sort of building up the idea that this is a man who uh, brings his family back to this, this tremendous archetype, sort of progenitor, genetrice, Trice of uh, Countess Matilda of Tuscany, and then he has this very powerful figure of the grandmother with whom he used to spend his summers. Um, Michelangelo, of course, he uh, he has a few more wonderful women that he talks about. Uh, the 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 talent for for sculpture he gives to he says the talent for sculpture comes from the he tells this to Giorgio Vasari. It comes from uh, he drank it in with the milk from his wet nurse, nurse who was a stone cutter's wife. Mona Margarita took care of her father, his father in her in his old age, and of course we know that Victoria Colonna was in many ways a great love of his life, and this really was a truly intellectual meeting of the minds and a great satisfaction in their relationship uh, until her untimely death. Insofar as Michelangelo's own personal life, we know he didn't marry. Um, he's, he neither did Raphael and neither did Leonardo. He, did, he was asked one day why he had never married, and his answer, of course, was, I have a, I have a wife, uh, I have one wife too many already, namely this art which harries me incessantly, and my works are my children. And after having studied for many years his personal habits and the way he was when he was on a job, I sort of feel like he did women a big favor by not getting married. <laughs> so the, um, the, uh, the, 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 <clears throat> the, the people that he spent time with were mostly male. So for example, he doesn't do portraits which would have put him in the orbit of, Raphael does a lot of female portraits, Millionaire does female portraits, it would have put him in the orbit, but he doesn't do portraits. Uh, his, his patrons are pretty much exclusively male, so he really does live in a very male, male world. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of where his experience of women comes from is, is not tremendously uh, large. So um, uh, moving to the Sistine Chapel, though, there will be a, he, he, when he works in the Sistine Chapel, he produces a series of types of women, basically four. Uh, we have the, the progenitor of all humanity, the first woman, Eve. 
Uh, we have these prophetic women, these mantic women in the Sibyls. We have heroines represented. And what will be really the strongest focus of this little talk will be the images of motherhood that he represents, which I think are really the great unexplored territory of uh, Michelangelo. And then at the end of it, just sort of tying it back together into the woman that he represented the most and the woman who appears to be the matrix of all his considerations of women. So the Sistine Chapel, for those of you who do not know, it was painted, the vault of the Sistine Chapel was painted between 1508 and 1512, a little bit under duress. Uh, he had come down for Ro Ro to Rome for one reason. It was rerouted to do something of a simplistic commission. Julius II had asked him just to put the 12 apostles in the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But Michelangelo was not really the sort of person who did things the way other people did them. And so he reproposed a cycle of Genesis. And so the cycle of Genesis will end up being nine panels along the Sistine chapel ceiling. We can see them almost like skylights running through the center. And what is very, very interesting about this cycle is when you get to the core. So the first three is God creating stuff by himself. The last three are stories of Noah. But the dead center really begins to focus on the images of the creation of man and woman. So we already kind of start with a very, uh, a, a divergence from what we would expect um, <clears throat> in this kind of imagery. For example, uh, in the famous image, the most famous image we have of, of, of Michelangelo, it knows the uh, creation of man. And you know, we've discussed at length you know, the meaning of the positioning of Adam, the space between the two fingers, the wonderful article written by uh, Richard Meshberger in the JAMA of October 1990, in which he was looking at the outline of the Cape of God, and in it he saw the cross-section of a human brain. But there is something that's a little interesting also when we start looking a little bit more closely. This was noted by Heinrich Pfeiffer uh, in, in this sort of strange image of a female figure who is curled underneath his arm. And given the sort of way that she looks at Adam, and that Adam, the way she looks towards Adam, the assumption is that we are looking at Eve, which means that everywhere in the Sistine Chapel that there is a there is Adam, there is Eve. They are never separated, unlike any other representation of the image before, where Adam is solo and God is creating Adam. For the first time, we have Adam and Eve. Eve already sort of part of the program. So the idea that there's already sort of a plan in the works. And this is, of course, there's, there's, a, there's a deeper reason for why this would uh, uh, emerge as an idea. The Sistine Chapel was, of course, built by Pope Sixtus IV, who was a massive proponent of the, uh, of the, of the teaching of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. And the Franciscans held that in order for Mary to be immaculately conceived, we have to assume that God has the whole plan for salvation on his mind, and that because it is already planned, whether or not in the temporal line Mary exists or not, or, or Eve exists or not, they already exist. In the case of the Immaculate Conception, Mary already exists and therefore can already be immaculately conceived. So it's a very interesting way of taking Eve and using her as a reflection of the Mary that will later on be uh, the, 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 the subject of the, of, the, of the Sistine Chapel. What I want to notice in particular is that uh, the image of God interacting with Eve is uh, pretty remarkable. So look at it again, look at it a little bit more closely. As a matter of fact, I can just, um, I can, uh, hopefully I don't do something horrible by doing this. Yep, so you can give you a little closer look to it. Look at the interaction of the arms of God and this female figure. It's really quite a remarkable thing. This is not Eve like that pain in the butt that I've got to you know, bring out there to cause all these problems. It really gives this sense of a, of a tremendous intimacy <clears throat> between God and first woman. So his arm around her, her arm around his, there's a real sense of that this is something that's, that's, that's a very intimate plan and that, that the hand of God, if you look around the way it extends around her shoulder and it splays on the shoulder of a child. And now if you look very, very carefully, you'll notice Michelangelo, who's pretty good at human anatomy. I think we can all agree on that. Like he spends a lot of time studying human anatomy. He seems to have given God an extra knuckle. 
And that is an indication that he wants to make us notice something. So the link, the direct link from the first finger that goes to the atom curls around that central figure of Eve and then lands with the other finger landing extended and emphasized on the child who we are to assume is Jesus. So the whole plan of salvation, even as God is creating man, he is aware of Eve whose happy fault, as they sang in the Exalted in the Sistine Chapel, would eventually bring about the, uh, the, the incarnation and the salvation of humanity. So it's a very interesting way of using her already. This is how woman appears in the Sistine Chapel as this part of the plan, no way an afterthought. Then, <clears throat> sorry, little, this one here. Then we have this remarkably odd image of the, uh, the creation of woman, which by the way, this is always my, one of my favorite lines in the, in the Sistine Chapel. The creation of woman, uh, oh, okay, let's back up. It's the dead center of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. There are nine panels. So people who go there for the first time are always assuming that you know, it's, it's Adam who was the central panel of the Sistine Chapel, but actually it's not the creation of man, it's the creation of woman. I have been known to say that that's because Adam was only practice and God got it right later, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, pro it's much, much more connected to this question of the Immaculate Conception. And then if we look at how he represents um, the creation of women. I want you to take a look at these other two representations well known to Michelangelo. The one on the left is by Jacopo della Quercia. These are the famous doors of San Petronio in Bologna, which we know from his biographers he admired during his time in Bologna. And of course the other ones are Ghiberti's famous baptistry doors, which Michelangelo is on record as being called truly the doors of paradise. So these are works that he, when it comes time to thinking about how to represent the creation of woman, he certainly has uh, very distinguished precedents that he can look at. But in both cases, you see this very sylph-like image of uh, Eve, who sort of floats out of the side of Adam, sort of hovers before him. But instead, uh, Michelangelo goes in a very, very different direction, where she's this enormous figure that occupies the entire space of the panel. The bulk of the panel is given to the image of Eve, sort of extending already out of Adam's side, slumped in the corner against a tree, and then on the opposite side, this rather large image of God really just closing the frame on the opposite side, but Eve who becomes a bridge. Eve becomes the bridge between man and God, and already in that position of supplication and intercession. So again, building in his mind this, this image of this, this woman, who in many ways we can think of as you know, this church, who becomes this link between human beings and God. So it's again, very, very different type of imagery, thinking very much out of the box. Now, let's see. And then, of course, we have uh, the, the, the final um, section of Adam and Eve together, where they are together in sin, and they are together in the expulsion. And again, he makes an interesting change. When Adam and Eve are inside the Garden of Eden, I think the first thing to make clear, inside the Garden of Eden and outside the Garden of Eden, are essentially the same thing, right? So this is not a story about being in a tropical island paradise with like a swim up bar. This is a story that is not about, and unlike most artists with the exception of Masaccio in the, in the Brancacci Chapel in Florence, most artists took the opportunity to represent the Garden of Eden to show, you know, look at this tremendous amount of plants and animals that I can show you. But Michelangelo is completely uninterested in the, the surroundings. It's not about a place, it's about the human form. It's about what it means to be a human, it means to be embodied. And so the way he represents Adam and Eve in this pre-fall stage is really quite remarkable in that they are both very powerful. This is the way he will, he will um, convey to us the bodies that will never age, they will never die, they will never be sick, they will never be tired. So this perfection of the body, but within that perfection, he gives us a complementarity. In both, both man and woman reach for the forbidden fruit. 
on top of everything else. Adam is reaching towards the serpent. Mary's reaching upwards. Um, uh, Adam, Mary, Eve is reaching upwards. I um, have a favorite uh, image of the fall of man. It's by Dominicino. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, God who is berating Adam and Eve for, um, for eating the forbidden fruit. And, you know, and, and Adam's going like this. Pointing over towards pointing over towards Eve, so this is a very different scene, um, but the the both bodies, they're both uh, uh, represented as very powerful. But notice the subtle differences. He's more aggressive, and she's more languid. And so you already have this sort of vision of these differences between men and women in the representation of the two. And then, of course, in one of the most interesting um, immaculate conception. Uh, elements, we have the serpent that is causing the temptation represented as a woman, building up, the, 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 the representation of the serpent as a woman in art builds up that this duel between Eve and, 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 and the serpent, in the first round, Eve loses. But the duel will be reproposed with Mary, and Mary will win. It gives, that imagery gives women a role of protagonist in the story of salvation, both in the fall and then later in the redemption. And so it's actually a way of enhancing the importance of, the, of woman in this story. And then interestingly, and this is one of the most interesting things when I was working on that book, A Body for Glory, I was working together with a priest from the John Paul II Institute in Rome. And we worked together uh, to try to get a sense of how uh, Michelangelo worked with uh, whoever was theologically advising him. Michelangelo is irritating in that he doesn't like to share credit. So he never tells you who's helping, ever, under any circumstances. And so uh, we've had a lot of guessing about um, who, who I think there's more than one person involved, but we've done a lot of guessing about who are the figures who are, uh, who are helping him to, to understand. And in our conversations, we began to realize a little bit how uh, the discussion on the part of the theologian sort of translates into the artist developing the image. Michelangelo also, this is a very difficult part of art history. He really made life difficult for art history, that guy. Um, he did it by destroying systematically his drawings. So the way that you would have your notes for a paper, that your, 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 your critical apparatus, the things that you built all your ideas on, he made a point of destroying them. So it's really, really, really hard to understand how that figure of Eve ended up in the curve of, of God's arm because we don't see the process by which it happened. He's really quite irritating about it. It gave us reasons to like drink and fight for many years later. So the, the very interesting thing that the, that the theologian noted about the image of the fall of man is that it's very clear that the fall of man is being told to us through the transformation in the body. So this one, this one, all of us good art historians, we all notice that instead of the proud posture, the body hunches over. The bodies that were luminous, they grow dark. You can actually see the gravity dogging. The poor, poor Eve like, puts on 20 pounds in the space of minutes. And so you can see the body becoming, literally, it becomes a burden to man. You can actually see it happening. But one of the things that, that Father Jose Granados pointed out was the interesting way that where they worked together, so even, even though they're sinning, they have this kind of, they're working kind of together. In the fall of man, as they are exposed, she, he gets, she gets pushed into his shadow. His, his shoulder pushes her into his shadow. It's a very, very interesting observation, kind of these consequences of the fall. So this is the image of them. Again, a little bit closer. So then, uh, after he finishes with this central space uh, regarding the heroines, then he moves out to the corners where he represents, it's where the Eve was in the center, he moves out to the corners where he represents heroines of the Old Testament. It's heroes and heroines, but we are interested in the heroines. They are Judith and Esther. And again, um, it is fairly, I mean, Judith and Esther just repeating the same point I keep making. Um, Judith and Esther are always present when you're looking at some kind of cycle or imagery that's trying to talk about the Immaculate Conception. So if they're talking about Mary being immaculately conceived and her powers of intercession, they bring in these two heroines who are remarkably different, and they represent two different ways of heroic action. So again, not just one type of sort of way that a woman as an, as an actor or an agent, but two types of agency of women in order to, uh, in order to save their people. 
Here we have Judith and Holofernes, again, brilliantly represented, um, a, a very dramatic type of representation where it, 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 Holofernes has already been beheaded. As a matter of fact, the head is already in the tray. It's one of the very few, it's apparently the only self-portrait of Michelangelo in the, in the vault. Um, he's being, uh, uh, she, the, the, the Ada, the maid, is, is about to take the head, and as she is, um, as Judith is covering the head, it's as if she hears a noise and she turns back. So he charges the scene with a lot of drama. I mean, there's, a, there's got this body of the Laak one lying, um, lying, uh, 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 lying headless on the bed, and then you have this Judith in a sort of midway stance as she's exiting but looking back, which with that kind of twisting in the body, that's the way that Michelangelo conveys trauma. And she's directly across from David. So in both cases, representing these figures who are uh, uh, active heroines. This is of Judith, is the uh, Old Testament widow who, when Holofernes, uh, a Syrian general, wants to destroy all of the people in Jerusalem, you know, shows up with a bottle of wine, gets him drunk and chops off his head, comes over to the, goes back to the tent camp and says, yeah, problem solved. I mean, she's a wonderful example of this kind of, uh, 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 this, this, this female figure who by her actions, by her actual, yeah, I'm gonna fix this, uh, it, she, she, she saves the day. Interestingly, just to give you a little bit of the, of the groundwork of these other images of Judith, we tend to see Judith post, um, post beheading, doing a kind of victory walk, right? Art history usually, Botticelli, sort of strolling back with the head. Um, you have, uh, you have um, the, 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 the Donatello Judith, who's a little bit more forceful. She was uh, standing in front of the, um, of the Palazzo, de, where, where the David was. She's right where the actually David substituted her. Um, so you have this, um, you have this sort of very, uh, she's, a little, she's again a very dynamic figure. And then you have uh, Michelangelo, who said has this rushing home after the, after the deed is done. Then on the opposite side, you have um, another type of female agency, which is intercessory, and it's the story of Esther, whose beauty is what saves the day. Uh, fearful to uh, enter into the dining room of Asuerus, which will, or Xerxes, which will um, uh, result in her death. The punishment for interrupting dinner is death. She nonetheless uh, uh, gathers up all her courage and uh, enters the room, promptly faints, and then uh, Xerxes says, but you're so beautiful, what would you be afraid of? I can never say no to you. So that ability of the, 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 the woman, the, the, the attraction, the beauty of woman, and this will, of course, be translated into the Immaculate Conception as the purity and the, the, the tota pulcra s uh, of Mary, that you cannot say no to her. And so we have this much more subtle agency. It's very, very beautiful. She's hidden away in the corner. So we have the big old, uh, Michelangelo had recently found the Laocoon first century AD statue. He was really excited about it. So. He put it in the Sistine Chapel a lot. So it's Laocoon in every position you can possibly imagine. So it's, it's like Laocoon standing on his head is the only one we're missing. Anyway, so we have Laocoon sort of there for the punishment of Haman. But if you look over in the corner, there is this, and look at that lovely, delicate, feminine face. Just this, this beautiful, innocent, lovely, soft face of not, 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 not one that one would mistake for a man. And that delicate sort of way that she acts as a quiet figure in the background. So he juxtaposes, again, the variety of, of the way he represents women just keeps growing. So the one who's you know in the middle, she's running off with a head, versus the other one who in sort of a subtle way stands by the master, stands by the king, and influences him very quietly. So it's very, very diverse. And this is, again, we don't, this kind of dramatic uh, di diversity in the representation is not something we see in art. And then she's across from, of course, Moses uh, as the idea of a sort of intercessor. Then we get to the most famous female figures. I think when you think of the female figures of the Sistine Chapel, I think when most people do, we think of those remarkable Sibyls. Um, the Sibyls, which are a, a very, very important signpost in the, represent, in, the, in the narrative of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So the narrative of the Sistine Chapel starts with God creating light. We get the scene of the creation of man. 
we then arrive at the fall of man. Then you have Noah, who um, builds an ark and saves everybody. And then the last scene of the ceiling is Noah, who has become a farmer, grown grapes, invented wine, gotten drunk, and passed out naked in his barn. So that's a kind of funny way to end um, the cycle. And as a matter of fact, when you're just looking at it like this, or if you are actually in the space, you'll notice that the very first scene, which is closest to the altar, is very bright. And then the light progressively diminishes as you move away from the altar so that the drunkenness of Noah is empirically, you can see it for yourself, it's the darkest scene on the ceiling. And it's standing right by the exit door. So basically you, you're, 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 you're physically in the chapel. Your experience of this particular work is that when you're looking up, you know, one more step backwards and you're outside the door. And you are physically as far away from the altar, i.e. goal, i.e. God, as possible. And so the question becomes, how do I get from here to there. And that is where the last two parts of the Sistine Chapel come in. And the first series are the prophets and the sibyls. So most, most, the most obvious one is this, this one here, uh, the Zechariah saying, I see a light coming from the east. Um, but you'll notice that the juxtaposition, the change in color is remarkable. So you go from this very bland palette the whole way down and then suddenly it's like Michelangelo found a Crayola box and he uses this, this, this <clears throat> topaz yellow and this ruby red and this emerald green. It's very, very, it's very striking. And again, things that we discovered when they cleaned the chapel. It made no sense how the plan was to visually bring the viewer from this point back to the altar until the ceiling was cleaned and then suddenly it all became clear. And so as you return, you will have uh, the seven prophets and the five sibyls. The anchoring prophets over the entrance and exit door and over the altar are male. In particular, the prof prophet over the altar is Jonah. He has, to be, he has to be the prophet over the altar because he is singularly the prophet of the resurrection. He is every time you see this figure in the history of art, he means one thing, Jesus' death and resurrection. Jonah says, and that Jesus says, <clears throat> when people ask him, how do we know we're saved? The answer is invariably, uh, look for the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, so will I spend three days in the heart of the earth. So the magnificent image of Jonah is the one above the altar. But the question is, we have to get from here to there. And as we're doing this, we are brought towards the altar by the altering of the male prophets for the, for the Jewish people, the female symbols for the Gentiles. Now. It, on one hand, it is evident that the use of the prophets and the sibyls allows the Renaissance culture, which is in love with all things antique, to be able to draw on the antique uh, sources because the, the, the uh, sibyls, uh, their prophecies as read in the Renaissance, sound kind of Christian. There's a reason for that. It's mostly because they're written in the first and second century AD by sort of Jewish sects in, the, in, the, in Asia Minor after Jesus has already come into the world. So there is a reason for it. But when they read this in the Renaissance, this is like this. So on one hand, it really sort of in, it implies that there's some sort of preparation for the Gentile world. And it gives a justification for uh, the deep delving into or the deep mining of the pagan culture for the Renaissance world. So that's one reason. But the other reason is to be able to complement the male figures with female figures. And we see this beginning, the first evidence, the first, the first time Sibyls show up in art is in, um, is in Florence in uh, the Sassetti Chapel in Santissimi Trinità painted by Ghirlandaio teacher of Michelangelo in 1480. And so he uses, he's the first one to use these mantic women in the ceiling, sort of talking about this, these, these, these prophecies. Then we see them appearing everywhere. Pinturicchio, the beautiful floor of the Siena Cathedral, usually flanked by male prophets. So this, by the time Michelangelo was painting in 1508, 1512, it's been a generation of pairing sibyls and prophets. So now the question is, what is he doing that is new? What's he doing that's, that, that, that takes this to another level? 
And uh, one of them is the tremendous variety in the women that he is painting. This is, of course, the one on the left is the famous Delphic Sibyl, again, one of the first images to make it around the world to show the excitement or to ignite the excitement or the controversy, as many of you will remember, uh, regarding the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel. A truly youthful and remarkable figure with Michelangelo's signature arm across the front of the body, again, with her arm, to eyes turning backwards, but her body propelling you forward. One thing that is common to all of the figures in the Sibyls and the Prophets is that they are illuminated on the front side, which on the side that is the closest to the altar. So they're always illuminated on the side closest to the altar, and they increase in luminosity as you approach the altar. So her colors here, she and the Kumian Sibyl will be more saturated. When The next one I'll show you is the one that's closest to the altar, and it's a completely different use of light. It's actually quite remarkable. Not many, Nobody knew that Michelangelo had it in him to do this kind of painting. At any rate, the second one is completely different. It's the representation of the Kumian Sibyl, who, of course, is the beloved Sibyl of, of Italy. She hung out around Rome, somewhere between Rome and Naples. She, she took Numa on adventures. She's uh, yeah, so she, people love the Kumian Sibyl. She is, her, her backstory is, of course, that um, having been loved by a god, uh, she, was, she decided to ask, uh, uh, to ask for immortality, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. So she is looking her age um, after a while. At any rate, but what I, what I really want to get at about these women is that each one, in its own way, is a very authoritative figure. This is where some of the most amazing painting takes place. The way that they're given these benches, they're, sort of, they're fit into an architectural framework. So Michelangelo's experience as a sculptor architect designing the tomb of Julius II comes into play here because you see that he's painted this framework for them, and yet the women alongside the men, this is true of the male figures, they all seem to hulk out of that space. They're not confined into their little niches. They are you know, figures that break out of their space, and this really mm, emphasizes the power of these prophecies. Each one of these women and their solidity in their, their volume and their plasticity, it gives them a real, an, an authority. And I just give you by, for example, let's show you these. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna move a little bit ahead just to make my point. On the left, you have Filipino Lippi's lovely sibyls. They're lovely, they're, they're, they're very pretty. They all look alike. Um, Pinturicchio sibyls and Filipino Lippi sibyls. This is from Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which is a church that I think will never be open again. It was one of my favorite chapels. It's the first case of sibyls in Rome, and it's been closed for restoration for like five years now, so I'm hopelessly depressed. But anyway, these, um, this is the first time the sibyls appear in Rome. They're painted uh, in the Carafa Chapel <coughs> for, um, by, by Filippino Lippi. And then Pinturicchio, hard on his heels, paints the sibyls in the apartments of, 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 of um, of uh, Alexander VI Borgia, and they all look like this. They're all, they all look sort of, they're all, they all look the same. They're sort of these pretty little blonde girls with their flowing hair. Um, once Michelangelo has made the Sibyls the way he, the, the, his Sibyls, uh, the way you represent Sibyls changes dr drastically. We can see that in the art of Raphael, but that was the point I was trying to make about the way that the, these authoritative figures by having a real physical presence like they're not these just little ectoplasms. The, 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 the physicality, the, 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 the volume of these figures gives them a tremendous sense of authority. And then this is the one that is closest to the altar. She's matched by Jeremiah. They are the, the, the penultimate uh, prophets before you get to Jonah. They are among the largest figures of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. She is a really stunning work of art. Uh, with this is a very graceful positioning as she's turned to the back and closing the books of prophecies. But if you notice what he's done with the color at this point, these saturated colors have been increasing so that really the, 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 from, the, from the orange, the sort of pumpkin orange we see in the Delphic Sibyl, by the time we get to the Libyan Sibyl, we have the color of flame. So he's really sort of intensifying the, the colors. Also, um, it's a very interesting uh, thing to look at this figure. Um, the, the, the model, as in the case of Raphael, 
The model for this figure is male, and Raphael's Sybils are also male models. You grab a studio hand who's young, and you, you have the studio hand pose. So these are, they start out as male models that are adapted by the artist. The way that Michelangelo adapts this particular figure, I think, is really quite remarkable. He picks up a little bit of that lovely diaphanous, the way that the Botticelli does those lovely diaphanous um, uh, veils across the body. And you can see him doing this. It's something you, you wouldn't really expect him to even have that in his toolbox, the ability to give us that sort of soft, gauzy material that reveals the lower part of her legs. But in particular, the cinching of the waist, that swelling of the hips, it's a very sensual and feminine figure that he produces even though she, I mean, it's a very, it, it, at, at the same time, a very sort of powerful figure. And so the way that Michelangelo, as a rule, represented, I'm not going to be talking about the Last Judgment, so uh, only very briefly and not in the case of the larger groups of female figures, but the, the way that Michelangelo represents fortitude, these virtues that are generally understood to be virile, that are understood to be male, uh, people who are strong, people who are um, uh, uh, authoritative, the way he conveys that visually and the way the audience would understand it is through these very powerful bodies. So the, 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 the adapting or, or, or the um, representation of the female form as something powerful. It, it, the only matrix he has to look at is the male form. We don't have, uh, uh, what's that called, uh, CrossFit in the Renaissance. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it's sort of interesting when you think about it, so you're looking here with Botticelli next to Michelangelo, it's a lot like the difference between the way women were represented in sort of the late 60s and early 70s, where they're all sort of will-of-the-wisps, super thin, they sort of the, the twiggies out there, and that's that kind of aesthetic, versus, you know, the very, the, every supermodel had a workout video in the 80s, and so, you know, the representation of beautiful women were these strong women, the big boxy shoulders, I, I just, I, I and now that I know that we're the same age, I can mention like back. We, we, live, we lived in a deeply problematic age for fashion. Whew. But anyway, so there was a lot of that. So that, you'll see, like that, that sort of the big shoulder, everybody had shoulder pads, and this kind of this idea of this, you know, strong, you know, the, 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 and that was a way of representing, um, uh, that, that was a kind of, that was aesthetic, and it was a way of sort of representing the increased number of women in the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, it's not such a strange thing. I'm always a little surprised at, um, at, at, at a 20, 20, 21st century that seems to marvel at women like this one because I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem so strange to me given you know, our own present aesthetics. <clears throat> Sometimes I put pictures of Pamela Anderson in here to make my point, but I didn't think I would do that today. Anyway, so these are our civils before and after. And so yes, yeah, so here's the thing about the, the, male, the male models. So we can see here that to get the positioning of the figure and to get the arms and the, the, the turn of the head, he needs, he, he needs a model to be able to catch all of the aspects of the drawing. Um, but you can see that um, he's going to be playing with it in order to sort of cinch the waist and create that sort of flame-colored hip. Um, and then Raphael, on the other hand, he's also using a male studio hand to do his sibyl. But when they come out, I mean, Michelangelo, you see how both artists make a point of transforming them into, into something that is, that is female. So it's really, it's a question of, um, it's a question of necessity. Uh, female models are a little hard to come by. You needs to be your wife, uh, often a prostitute. So um, uh, it was the, the custom was to use studio hands as, as, as the models. So now we get to the part that I am actually the most interested in. This is the great, really to me, the great, redis the great discovery of the, um, of the cleaning of the ceiling. And it is, uh, it's these women who are mothers, the number of mothers. And it's a, uh, it, uh, the, 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 it's from the beginning of, um, of, of, of Matthew, right? The begats, as they call it, Abraham begat, Abraham begat, Isaac begat. So, in order to bring us from the fall of man and the drunkenness of Noah to Jonah, 
Michelangelo employed not only the Sibyls who are prophesizing the coming of a savior, a savior to, a, to the Gentiles and to the Jews, he also used a series of families. And the, the ancestors, the genealogy, are taking us generation by generation by generation to that point. And the amazing thing about this is that of the 42 generations in, um, that, are, that are noted in, in Matthew, only seven women are named, right? No, five women are mentioned. Now, Matthew's, got, Matthew's got five and, and, and Luke's got seven. Only, only, anyway, they are, they are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. So these women don't have names, right? Michelangelo decided that even though they didn't have names, they would have faces and they would be represented. And this is the part that I, 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 have, I have been looking at uh, representations of the ancestry of Mary, the ancestry of Jesus, over and over and over and over again. There's nothing they love more than the tree of Jesse, line of kings. Every now and then you might get a lineup of the male line, but no one, no one had ever complimented a father with a mother all the way through the genealogy. There are 22, there were two, there were several that were destroyed when they went to paint the Last Judgment, but the fact of the matter is that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a remarkable compendium of these incredibly varied female images. Now what makes this particularly interesting is that they are painted at unbelievable speed. So here's again the information that comes out in the restoration of the Sistine Chapel is we know how long it takes for him to paint something. In the, in the medium of fresco, the, the artist puts up a certain amount of plaster that he can cover in the course of a day. That's about six hours. The, 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 the segment is called a giornata, a day's work. And we know how many giornata it takes for an artist to do something because it always leaves a seam. So you can always trace back where the artist began and where the artist finished. The Sibyls took 18 giornate, 16, 18 giornate. They are very, very long, complicated paintings. These, one, two, maximum three days. He's working at very, very high speed. He also, uh, as opposed to the Sibyls, which are the prophets or all of the other figures with the sole exception of um, the separation of light and dark, uh, he works with uh, a technique of transferring his drawing onto the ceiling. It means he's prepared a drawing elsewhere, and then he takes the drawing, he puts the working drawing, or the cartoon as it's called, he puts it up against the surface. He either outlines it or he pounces it, he, he punches holes in it and makes little dots for him to follow. There is, there is no line, there are no lines and no pouncing in these figures. And so it's very, very interesting to see the incredible, these, that means that is the closest you can come to a candid photograph. It means he's looking and he's painting. He's looking and he's painting. He's walking back home and then he's you know, looking and he's painting. And, and he's looking, then it gets even more interesting because what he's looking at is the women in particular. So we'll start here with this sort of this terrific, this Mary's, Mary's headdress which is completely crazy. Um, but it turns out that you know, there's a lot of this, the people really love this kind of stuff. So you see this Filippo Philipp, Lippi is kind of the specialist. Botticelli, Filippo Lippi was a specialist at the uh, translucent veil stuff. Polaiolo, on the other hand, you can see it. There's the sculptural headdress. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that Michelangelo has an eye for women's fashions. He's keeping it, these outfits that he's looking at. They have extra details that you wouldn't really expect. Um, the, um, see, there's where Mary's, Mary's headdress looks, looks very similar to what Polaiolo shows as a kind of popular female headdress. After all, he did begin his career painting under in the great Ghirlandaio studio, and Ghirlandaio was kind of, Ghirlandaio, his name means his father used to make floral headdresses for women. I mean, he's up to here in the fashion industry, and as a matter of fact, we see his really beautiful textiles in these stories of the Tornaboni Chapel, including the birth of the Virgin and the stories of John the Baptist. Here, this interesting juxtaposition where Michelangelo may not want to get involved in every single detail of Florentine embroidery, but look that he does add special details to the clothing. So he's looking at women and he's looking at how they're dressed. He's kind of creating a mix between uh, the contemporary Florentine fashions 
and something that looks a little bit more antique. But they're very, very, very interesting. It's, it's just a, it's an aspect of Michelangelo we're not really expecting. The other thing that you can see that's inspiring him is that down below in the section that was painted under Sixtus IV in the Sistine Chapel between 1480 and 1482, painted by people like Ghirlandaio, Botticelli, Per Perugino, and Luca Signorelli. And Luca Signorelli, with his amazing group of women holding children there, you can see that there's already a kind of groundwork for this representation of families in the Sistine Chapel. As a matter of fact, you see a lot of families in that lower section. These are some of his, this is his, these are his sketches, <laughs> including these little sort of bits and pieces here. Uh, so there's the father, that's a mother. And then over there, you see there's a little writing on the right hand side where it's literally, he writes, dagli bere. So literally, sort of uh, give him something to drink. And it's one of the nursing mothers. So you see he's sort of thinking in terms of this interaction of, of women with their small children. And then, and then, and then the actual representation of these women compared to the men. So among these 22 women, uh, I think there is, uh, there is something like uh, 13 of the women are hard at work, and uh, most of the men are sitting around doing nothing. So you have, uh, so these are some of my, my favorites over here. You have the mom on the right, who's literally got kids climbing all over her. Right, and I, 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 don't, he, I don't know what he's doing. Uh, he's writing the great, the great novel over there. And then you have on the other side this other representation of a woman who's preparing food. So busy women. This is this this is observational. This comes from looking at women, looking at families, looking at so the turn of the head, the braid falling over the shoulder, uh, um, uh, uh, this sort of spontaneity already in the execution, but also in what he chooses to represent. My favorite, the rocking the cradle with her foot while holding the baby in her arms, of course, showing off some of his super mega foreshortening skills. Um, the coloring, which is also very interesting because it's an undercroft, so that's where we see his first use of this shot silk coloring where he's using a kind of a complementary or contrary color, contrasting color in order to make the figures more visible. He actually wants you to notice them. And so um, I was going to end this little section with um, the poem he wrote while he was painting these. So if you'll bear with me, um, the, uh, he writes a poem while he's painting these, which is one of my all-time favorite Michelangelo poems. It's not going to be, it's not going to be, I don't think you've ever heard it. Uh, he uh, writes a poem about being a woman's dress not wearing a woman's dress, about being a woman's dress. And it goes, all through the day, her dress is well contented. It binds her breast, then seems to stretch, and what they call the filigree gold has touched her neck and cheeks and cannot make an end. But happier still, that ribbon seems delighted, having a golden tip made in a manner to press and touch the breast that it has yoked. And I believe the simple sash that's knotted says to itself, I'd stay here forever. How would it be then that my arms would act? That's literally the Easy Tiger um, poem of Michelangelo. Just this, uh, sort of a reference. Really, I, 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 I think a lot about um, a man at Michelangelo's age. He's about 33 to 37 when he's painting this. He's just made a ton of money. He's clearly got a very good career underway. Do you know what they're asking him every day when he goes to work in the Vatican? What's the first question? So, Mike, when you get married, and so I really think this sort of, as he's looking at these women, I think it's also, I, this is in my own head, I think that this is also as he's discerning, you know, is his vocation to marriage or is it going to be to something else? And then I'm just going to conclude by pointing out to you that all of these women that he represents have one matrix. That woman is Mary, the woman whom he, 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 he he came to fame with his images of Mary. Uh, you'll remember, you'll remember, but uh, the very first images that Michelangelo makes uh, is the Madonna of the Stairs. That was his first sculpture. So he's always been working on Mary his, all his life. This, uh, these variations here, you have Mary wearing an outfit which is very, very similar to the woman we saw uh, uh, in, the, in the Sistine Chapel with the same kind of drop sleeve. Uh, we have the Medici Madonna with that sort of lovely baby Jesus turning to nurse. We can see that, that in, in sculptural form playing around with what he's going to do with the um, uh, uh, what he's going to do with the mothers of the Sistine Chapel. This Bruges Madonna, which is a remarkable image where you see Mary, she's holding Jesus. 
Jesus takes a step forward, and she's looking a few steps in front of him. And this is you know, the Mary who is a prophetess. This is the Mary who sees, who may not know exactly what's going to happen, but she already, her vision is ahead. She's looking at what's happening and storing it in her heart. She's watching her son take those steps, already looking to where those steps will lead. So this idea of Mary is prophetess, some lovely images of her face. I love the, the, the active Mary, the incredibly energetic Mary of the Donitondo who reaches back to grab her child and the natural conclusion, it's like an unresolved chord, the natural conclusion of that movement is that she will put the child in front of you. So you see someone who's very much in the act of bringing the savior into the world, specifically to you. And then, of course, the more contemplative Mary who offers up her son. So this is much more uh, the woman who accepts the will of the Lord as she offers up her son. And then, of course, Mary as the new Eve. And I'm just going to end with this. My only time I can ever show you the, what Michelangelo, I, the only time I have proof of what Michelangelo was thinking. The last judgment, when he was constructing the space around Jesus, when he was thinking about the image of Jesus as judge, he was thinking about how to represent Mary in that situation. In the history of art, Mary in the Last Judgment never, ever, ever shares the throne with Jesus. She sometimes stands, usually a little lower down, directly opposite of, from John the Baptist. In the first image you see that he produced in the Musée Bonnet, which is today in the Musée Bonnet, uh, you see Mary who's down in the lower corner, and you see that same image of the hands clasped, that sort of praying image that we saw in the eve of the creation of woman. Then... In Casa Buonarroti, he has Mary get up, and she opens her arms as she approaches her son. And look at the people in back of her. They're literally all following, as if she's still holding that famous mantle of hers, which she gathers the soul. So she goes to approach her son, and then he did the unthinkable. He put her right next to him on the throne, right by the wound in Christ's side from whence the church sprang. So Mary becomes, in this work, she's literally everything. She is, the, she, is, she is the bride of Christ. She is the mother of God. And she is the ultimate intercessor, looking down towards the faithful. The other one, Giotto, is to just show you it's not customary to have Mary next to Jesus. Even the gentle gesture of Christ frames the wound through which, uh, which, from which the church sprang. So we literally see that return to the idea of Eve coming out of Adam's side, and as such, because it becomes the bridge for the salvation of the faithful. The, the image of Mary gazing downward comes from this fiat. Why is Mary so powerful? Because of Mary's acceptance of divine will, something we see already in, uh, in, uh, in Fra Angelico, but at the same time, his love for her is similar to that of the love of Xerxes for Esther, because this using Mary based on this ancient statue of Venus, so you have this, this irresistible, on one hand, uh, this ultimate image of, of desirable in Venus, mixed with that gentle fiat of the woman who said, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. It's the most brilliant, the most unusual, un, un, unimaginable image of Mary uh, uh, that, that had ever been produced. And so with that, we conclude. It was a little bit of a romp through the images of Mary, but I, more than anything, I really wanted to just give you an overview of uh, looking at this type of imagery on, on the part of Michelangelo. Um, but I am happy to talk about images more specifically as you like. Thank you. So the question, which is, which is an interesting question, and probably the most difficult one I can imagine, uh, is how, 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 how do I think about this? Um, how does this, I guess it's how does this come to me? It's been an extremely long process. This is about 20 years of, of work, starting with a lecture at the American University of Rome that I just went to one afternoon, and Heinrich Pfeiffer's proposal that that was Mary, in the, that was Eve in the arm of, um, under the arm of God. And from there, the from there the uh, under the the, the 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 being I'm in there all the time. The, the 
these women just kept coming out at me. So they, and then, and then I started doing work on these sibyls, and you know, where they come from, and how, where they, where, where they first show up, what they look like before, and what they look like after. But mostly, um, the real, for me, the most exciting thing was uh, just wondering about. I just was very taken with those images of the mothers holding children, and. Uh, and beginning to track that down, beginning to track down the ancestry and really looking at every possible image of the ancestry of Christ I could find, France and Italy, wherever there are, oh, I, there's a rumor, there's an image of the ancestry of Christ, let's go look at that. Um, and, uh, and then the, the consultation with the restorers, which suddenly opened up a whole new, Vista, once you understand the difference in the way part of the painting is produced and the other part of the painting is produced, you really can begin to start analyzing um, what, what he's thinking. Uh, when, he's, when he's painting in one way on the undercroft and he's painting in another way. And if he were painting just quickly because he wanted to get it over with, that doesn't explain the incredible amount of detail that he adds, the amount of observation. Like There's no need to throw the three kids all over the mom unless that's something that you really want to explore artistically. He added infinite amount of work to himself. So it's really, it, it, that's, that's been a big part of it. A lot of it has also been, um, many, many years ago I got interested in the way the Immaculate Conception is represented in art and the way that the genesis of imagery of the Immaculate Conception, how do we go from, I think there might be something special about Mary to, you know, everybody knows, lady in the blue and white standing on the cloud, it's Mary, it's the Immaculate Conception. How do we get from there? And the really long and, and, and very beautiful process that the church had to wrestle with, I, I, I think I have a Dominican in here, so I'm getting really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the really long process that the church had to wrestle with before it could finally declare the Immaculate Conception a dogma in um, 1854. And, and to me, that was really, studying that just, it cracked everything open. I was like, oh, 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 oh. So she's like a big deal, this Mary. <laughs> and so, and that's, that I think was really a pivotal part of it. So the question is about the language of fiat in the painting of Fra Angelico and um, Michelangelo, which refers to the earlier slide where I was showing the Annunciation, where Mary's head is bowed and her hands are crossed uh, across her body. Um, I do, um, I think the language, uh, Florence is a particularly um, attuned city for the Annunciation. I mean, it is the city of the Annunciation. Um, and uh, yeah, the feast and the, the parties and the parades. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard for us, I think, sometimes to understand because March 25th comes and goes and nobody cares. But um, March 25th in Florence, everybody gets the day off work, you all pile into the square, there's gonna be like really cool things that they've been planning all week, there are gonna be parades and shows, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's a thing. And, um, and so the, the, they're very attuned to it. I think we were talking about this the other day as well. Um, and, and one of the great, great, great moments in my, my, my studies here was when I was just introduced to uh, Michael Baxandal and the breaking down of the, uh, the Annunciation moments. So really asking yourselves questions, like, uh, artists asking questions about what part of the five segments of the back and forth between the angel and Mary am I going to show? And that's a that's a really interesting question. And 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 the Florentines they explore they explore several different types. So we've got Florentines going like, oh my gosh, what's he like? So the wonderful Sandro Botticelli who's like, you know, get this angel out of my room. And then, but 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 Fra Angelico, who of course is painting in this in a convent, he's painting for prayers. His works are specifically for prayer for a group of men whose entire lives are about you know, giving themselves to God and repeating this fiat. So his language is far more, he's, he's really, he's not interested in Mary saying, yeah, I, let me think about this for a minute. Or Mary, you know, like I'm surprised by the angel. His whole body of work is really about the, uh, the, the, the way that Mary accepts divine will. Michelangelo, that, 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 um, that Pieta with the, with the, with the, serene face of the youthful Mary, which I think the reason for the serene face, I, do, I have no time for the 
Freudian, he missed his mommy who died when he was six. That's not, that's not what's going on here. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that maybe she's, uh, she's a young woman holding her baby, telescoping in a kind of prophetic, prophetic matter, manner to when, what's going to happen later on. But mostly I think about that downcast eyes that are so from the body of work of Fra Angelico, that moment when she was 15 and she's or 14 or 15 or whatever she was, and she said, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be done to me according to thy will. And the implication being that she said yes when she was 15 and she meant it. And she means it 33 years later. So 33 years, a whole bunch of stuff has happened. She doesn't go, yeah, okay, well that was then and this is now. But Mary's constancy in her yes, and I, that's what I think that, that fiat expression is in the art of Michelangelo too. And that's, that's a kind of heroic, that's, that's what makes the heroic fiat someone who, yeah, it's one thing when she said yes then, okay, yeah, I put up with having the baby in the cave, and yeah, okay, I had to go to Egypt. But this idea that, you know, right down to the foot of the cross, when all of this is taking place, she's still trusting in God. And I think there are things in the way that the work is executed, the contrast between light and dark, that you can make an argument that, 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 that is visually apparent in the work. This is one of the most controversial restorations in the history of restorations. And the author of the book that nearly made me quit art history, when he became the leader of the, this was a bad restoration school. And so um, there is the Art Watch and, 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 and Professor Beck, uh, it were, they contested that. They contested it in several different ways. First they said that there was some sort of patina that Michelangelo put on his work that uh, was intended to make the painting look darker. The only problem with that is that we can't find any evidence of him doing that at any other occasion. Um, and uh, now that I, I know the restorers and I know the people who restore and I know the way the restoration is done, um, the, the restoration was done, uh, the way I would describe it is an extremely humble restoration because as they're working on the restoration, they're realizing all the other restorations that have gone before and the information that they don't have. So every single thing they did to the painting they document it just in case, you know, a hundred years from now with infinitely more sophisticated techniques. So um, I, I don't believe they took off a, um, a layer of something that he intended to darken the painting. Um, I, I, I don't. This, I could, oh, I'm sorry, I should have repeated the question, um, but I think it's fairly evident what we're talking about. I, I, the, 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 the jumble of different uh, problems I have with that argument are all kind of flooding together into something that would go on forever. But I, I can give you a couple ideas. Um, one is, the, it is actually the ancestors that I was talking about are one of the most important signs that there was not a patina added. Because the way he paints them is completely innovative and the kind, type of color technique he's using, there's no reason why he would use that kind of color technique and then blot it out. So it makes no, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the other thing is that he produces his painting in 1512 and then I remember this in art history, I remember this from my old art history classes. In 1512 he produces his painting, in 1515 there are a whole bunch of people who are using these wild and crazy color techniques and we would go in art history, scritch, 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 we have no idea where these painting techniques came from, from the mannerists in Florence and then they clean the ceiling and you're like, oh, okay, there it came. So we also have the immediate reaction of people who are playing around with this color techniques which again suggests that, um, that they were meant to be visible. Gentlemen, it's all about you. I mean, I'd say, I'm just, I'm trying to pull a little, just pull a little trickle over in the direction of the women here. But the painting is really, it's all about, it's made for men. Only men went to the Sistine Chapel, and it's mostly, the Last Judgment is mostly men. And it's Adam who is the, is the, you know, the great figure at the cusp of, 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 of awareness. And, and Jonah's the most, most, most remarkable figure of the Sistine Chapel saying, you know, it's, it is a painting that is meant to uh, draw out excellence in both men and women. But the only thing is that for, I mean, so I actually took this out because of time, but I have an image of the John the Baptist that I usually use next See, this is a horrible slide, forgive me. Um, here's John the Baptist, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, John the Baptist lived in the desert and ate wild locusts and honey. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a bulk up diet. <laughs> <laughs> and then right next to him, you have, I think this is probably Perpetua and Felicity, who again, as, I, as you were saying, they were like the Williams sisters. It's an idea of 
John the Baptist is not a powerful man. We don't expect him to be a physically powerful man. But because his inner fortitude, what, what he's showing us is the interior, the only means by which Michelangelo can show the interior fortitude is through the external form. And the men get it all the time, but people don't understand when he uses that for women because there is no female model. There is no Serena Williams for him to look at. So he has to take the male power and adapt it to a female form. But the idea being, word I don't love, empowerment of the female figures. So the other thing that I, I, again, I took out because of time, those particularly busy women, they, uh, they are around where you see God creating the sun, the moon, the vegetable life. So God's busyness um, seems to be paralleled by this female busyness. I just, it was, it, it, I had them just, I was going to sort of throw that out there. Because I just think it's an interesting thing that, that, that you have this emphasis on God who is you know, bringing forth, he's doing, God just does like crazy. And then you have, um, you have these women who seem to be participating, they are participating in creation, in creating these lives, but also in the busyness of, of nurturing them. So yeah, I, th I think it's, I, I'm, I'm totally taken with, um, with, with this. I, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking for, we got a little bit from Nicola di Cusa, but I'm looking, I can't seem to find, I wish I could just find a text that really talked about complementarity, but I haven't found it, I haven't unearthed it yet. If you find one, let me know. <laughs>